just don't remember when. Think it's time to watch it again. Follow, subscribe, stay up to date. Episodes drop the last Friday. It's a man, it's a man, forgot that. It's a man, it's a man, forgot that. It's a man, it's a man, forgot that. Welcome to the Matt Forgot That Podcast, the place to recollect and reminisce. I'm your host, Matt Sarosky, filmmaker, film fan. Each episode, I'm going to rewatch and review a movie or TV pilot that I've seen before but don't quite remember. It could be a blockbuster, critic's choice, or cult classic. To join in on the conversation, follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, at Matt Sarosky. You can subscribe to my YouTube page where I'll post videos and clips from the show. If you have any opinions on what I've reviewed or want to share your own trip down memory lane, use the hashtag MattForgotThat on social. Before we start, I wanted to talk about Hollywood, the land of reboots, remakes, and reimaginings. Now look, I understand that studios want a sure thing, and they'd rather invest their money in a property that has a valued track record versus an original, untested script. But it's always the good movies that they want to rework, and it's rare that they actually improve it. Off the top of your head, how many remakes are actually better than the original? I know there are some out there. I watched one recently, John Carpenter's The Thing, but at least he waited 30 years. And the original was black and white, so I can give that one a pass. I believe that studios should spend the time to focus on the movies that had potential, but for whatever reason, didn't reach that pinnacle. And there are plenty. Just look at canon. They have an incredible library of -of middle-of-the-road movies that you get the right writer and director, and you can come up with something special. Put a nice sheen on it. But that brings me to this week's review. I was endlessly scrolling through HBO Max. Oh, um, excuse me. Um... Max. And I came across an intriguing title, Eraser Reborn. It stars Dominic Sherwood from Vampire Academy and Shadowhunters. And when I started reading the description, it sounded oddly familiar to a movie from the 90s starring Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I looked it up and it indeed was a reimagining of that concept. Unfortunately, it doesn't go there enough to distinguish itself from the original, but that's the effort that I want producers to make. Find a movie that was just okay and figure out how to improve it. People want to like movies. We all root for movies. We don't spend eight, ten, fifteen dollars on what we hope is a bad movie. But if studios are going to insist on feeding us with these reboots, remakes, and reimaginings, at some point the appetite isn't going to be there. On to the main attraction. Each review will end with a ranking out of five stars. One star is Skip It, two stars Watch at Your Own Risk, three stars Standard Fair, four stars Worth Checking Out, and five stars Must See. Now, if I give a title five stars, it doesn't mean I'm comparing it to Casablanca or Jaws or Seinfeld. I rank titles based on other movies or TV series in that genre and at that time period. In this episode of the podcast, I'm rewatching and reviewing Eraser from 1996. Now, I didn't mean to be so Arnold-heavy this season. I mean, two episodes of 12 dedicated to the Austrian wonder seems a little excessive. But after watching the reimagined version, I wanted to revisit the original. I've also been on an action kick lately, so when you think of that genre, the first names you think of are Schwarzenegger and Stallone. They're tops on the list. So here we are. It was directed by Chuck Russell, who helmed A Nightmare on Elm Street 3, Dream Warriors, the remake of The Blob with Shawnee Smith, The Mask, and The Scorpion King. He was an executive producer on Collateral, which was nominated for two Academy Awards. The screenplay was co-written by Tony Perrier, who was the first to scribe a $100 million budget summer blockbuster with this movie, and Waylon Green, who scribed The Brinks Job, War Games, Robocop 2, and The Animated Dinosaur. It was based on a story by the screenwriters and Michael S. Chernuchin, who worked on Law & Order. It stars Arnold Schwarzenegger as U.S. Marshal John Eraser Kruger. I went through a career retrospective in episode one of the podcast, so no need to rehash. But this movie is considered the last of his golden era. This was followed by Jingle All the Way, a harmless holiday family movie. 
Batman and Robin, which effectively killed the franchise for a couple of years. He tried to rekindle the magic of Terminator with Rise of the Machines. It did well at the box office, but without that Cameron touch, fell short of the expectations of the rabid fans. It wasn't until a cameo in 2010's The Expendables that whetted people's appetite for on-screen action stars again. This is what I remember. The basic plot. John Kruger erases the identities of witnesses by staging their deaths and relocating them with new personas. Vanessa Williams. She burst on the scene in 1984, winning the Miss America crown. Her 1991 album The Comfort Zone had her biggest hit, Save the Best for Last, which has the conspiracy theory lyric, Sometimes the sun goes round the moon. Nope. No, it doesn't. Never has. While she started acting in the 80s, appearing in episodes of the Red Fox show T.J. Hooker and the Love Boat, as well as supporting roles in The Pickup Artist and Under the Gun, this role catapulted her onto the big screen, leading to parts in Soul Food, Hoodlum, and Dance With Me. The last thing I remember is that there was a scene involving alligators or crocodiles. I think. Like they're swimming in water, but it's in a house or a building. I might be mistaking it for Jumanji. We'll see. Now I'm heading off to watch the movie. This is what I forgot. The amount of Jameses in the supporting cast. James Caan, James Colburn, James Cromwell. This movie is all in on J.C., all three men have been Oscar-nominated in the Best Supporting Actor category, with James Colburn winning for Affliction. There is a bit of a plot twist, so let's jump into it. Eraser begins at 232 Alton Drive. A witness in a court case, Johnny Castiglione, and his wife are being manhandled by a group of thugs, sent by defendant Mr. Kennelly. Before they could put the kibosh on the pair, U.S. Marshal John Kruger appears and quickly disposes of them. He fakes the death of Johnny and his wife, and takes photographic proof, along with all their identification, and replaces their bodies in the house with two on ice from the morgue. He plants the pictures on the deceased thugs, and creates the appearance that they've killed the witness and his wife, then turned on each other. Then he sends the house ablaze just as the local police arrive, effectively erasing their former lives. The next day at Witsec, the Witness Security Protection Program, Kruger is assigned a new case, Lee Cullen is a senior director at the major defense contractor, Cyrez Corporation. Someone inside the company is trying to sell top-secret weapon research, and the feds need her to prove their case. She would be the key witness for the prosecution. The sting occurs tomorrow. At the Cyrez offices, Lee Cullen is tasked by the feds with entering a maximum security area and copying the files for evidence. She has a five-minute window to transfer the files, where she'll lose transmission with her spotters momentarily. As she exits, Lee is taken by security to the office of the Vice President of International Division, Mr. Donahue, who has security footage of her entering the area. When he realizes she's been working with the feds, he pulls a gun on her, but instead turns it on himself and commits suicide. After narrowly escaping from the building, the feds bring Lee to Kruger for WITSEC protection. Here's a quote without context. You know, some people take things for granted, like the ability to chew solid food. Eraser has an interesting premise that's turned up to 11. It's everything you could expect from an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. Lots of explosions, action set pieces, cringy one-liners. It's the 90s version of an 80s action movie. There are a couple of scenes that you roll your eyes at, but otherwise, it's a decent action flick. Now for a little trivial trivia. Years later, Vanessa Williams and John Slattery would find themselves on Wisteria Lane as part of Desperate Housewives. Eraser was produced by Ann and Arnold Copelson. It was filmed by Coastally in New York, including the Reptile House of the New York City Zoo, the Harlem Rail Yard, Central Park, and Brooklyn Borough Hall, and Los Angeles at LA City Hall, LA Zoo and Botanical Gardens, Kelly Gulch, and of course, Warner Brothers Burbank Studios. The cinematography was captured by Adam Greenberg, whose filmography includes The Terminator, La Bamba, Three Men and a Baby, Ghost, Sister Act, and Dave. He was nominated for a Best Academy Award in 1992 for Best Cinematography of Terminator 2 Judgment Day. 
He was specifically chosen by Arnold to work on this project, based on his experience with the Terminator movies, and would join forces in two additional films, Junior in 1994 and Collateral Damage in 2002. It was edited by Michael Tronick, who worked on Beverly Hills Cop 2, Less Than Zero, Days of Thunder, True Romance, and Remember the Titans. The score was composed by Alan Silvestri, who wrote the music for Back to the Future, The Delta Force, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, The Bodyguard, Grumpy Old Men, and The Avengers. He's been nominated for two Academy Awards for Best Music, Original Score, of Forrest Gump, and Best Achievement in Music, Writing for Motion Pictures, Original Song, for The Polar Express. He's a frequent collaborator with Robert Zemeckis. The soundtrack featured songs by Dean Martin, The Weather Girls, and Vanessa Williams, who perform Where Do We Go From Here, which appears over the end credits. The runtime is 1 hour 54 minutes. It had a budget of $100 million and grossed $242 million at the box office. On the Ski Index, I give it 3.5 out of 5 stars. If you've seen Eraser and have opinions on the movie, let me know what you think using the hashtag Matt forgot that. Moving right along, each episode, I'm going to post clips that I think people should watch. It could be movie trailers, music videos, interviews, or something completely random. Search for my YouTube page and there'll be a playlist called Matt Forgot That Playback. Eric Carmen. No, I'm not talking about the big bone cheesy poof eater from South Park. No, this is Eric Carmen the singer-songwriter who had a string of hits in the 70s and 80s, including All By Myself, Hungry Eyes, and Make Me Lose Control. At the age of three, he was enrolled at the Dow Crow's Eurythmics program at the Cleveland Institute of Music. A few years later, he started playing the violin, but transitioned to piano at 11. He attempted to take guitar lessons at 15, but ended up teaching himself. Inspired by the Beatles, he played in a few rock bands during his high school years, while attending John Carroll University, he joined members of the disbanded groups Cyrus Erie and the Choir to form the rock and roll band Raspberries. He was the lead singer and contributed as main songwriter. Their self-titled debut featured their biggest hit, Go All the Way, which reached number 5 on the Billboard Hot 100. It was banned by the BBC for the suggestive title. After four albums together, they broke up in 1975. By the end of the year, Eric Carmen released his first self-titled solo album. The first single, All By Myself, was released in December and entered the Billboard Hot 100 at number 85. By March of 1976, it would reach number two. Its melody was inspired by the Raspberry song Let's Pretend and Sergei Rachmaninoff's classical composition Piano Concerto No. 2 in C minor. The album also included the song That's Rock and Roll, which failed to chart, but two years later would become a hit for Sean Cassidy, making it to number three on the charts. His second album, Boats Against the Current, didn't reach the heights of his debut, but the title track was covered by Olivia Newton-John and Patti LaBelle. His next album suffered a similar fate with other artists finding more success with his songs. In 1983, he would team up with Dean Pitchford, screenwriter of Footloose and co-composer of all songs on its soundtrack, including Holding Out for a Hero, Let's Hear It for the Boy, and the title track. They collaborated on the duet Almost Paradise, which was recorded by Mike Reno and Ann Wilson from Heart. Four years later, he would cover the track Hungry Eyes on the Dirty Dancing soundtrack. It was originally released in 1984 by the band Frank and the Knockouts. It rose to number four on the Billboard Hot 100, helping the album go on to sell 32 million copies worldwide. Eric Carmen's last significant hit was in 1988 with Make Me Lose Control, co-written with Dean Pitchford, reaching number three on the Billboard Hot 100 and number one on the adult contemporary chart. The middle a cappella section was reminiscent of his former band, The Raspberries. The song never appeared on any of his studio albums, but would be part of his greatest hits compilations. In 2013, he recorded his first studio album in 15 years, and continues to write and tour. So I've selected a couple of his biggest tunes. They're all available in the Matt Forgot That playback playlist on YouTube. Check it out. Now it's time for the recommendation. Yes, that's the word recommendation with Matt in the middle. I'm going to end each podcast with my own recommendation of a nostalgic movie or TV series. Today I'm talking about Roller Derby. In general. Kinda. 
The athletic competition started in 1935 in Chicago, when promoter Leo Seltzer read an article that stated 90% of Americans had roller skated in their lifetime. Having organized walkathons, he took that concept and added wheels. It began as an endurance race, with two teams comprised of both men and women, skating around a bank track, and skating, and skating, and skating. Sports writer Damon Runyon suggested that Seltzer focus less on the repetitive nature and more on the big hits. Seltzer took that advice and created the framework for what roller derby would become. There are 10 players on the track, 5 from each team consisting of 4 blockers and 1 jammer. Each time a jammer laps an opposing team member, they earn a point. With the invention of the television in the late 1940s, the contact sport became a national sensation. Despite much success into the 1970s, including drawing over 27,000 fans in Shea Stadium to watch the World Championships, the league folded in 1975. Then, in the mid-1980s, with the success of the World Wrestling Federation in the field of sports entertainment, Roller Games was created by television producer David R. Sams, Michael J. Miller, and league owner William Griffith Sr. The series took place at an airport hangar dubbed the Super Roller Dome. It featured a figure-eight track with obstacles including the Wall of Death and Jet Jump, where jammers could earn more points during the period. If you're wondering if this was a legitimate competition, there were good guys and bad guys, storylines, it was fairly common to see skaters using wrestling maneuvers including headlocks and big splashes, and the tiebreaker included an option of throwing your opponent into a pit filled with alligators to be declared the winner. Oh no, I didn't make that up. It was only featured in the pilot episode because, you know, possible death. Despite the hijinks, the series only lasted one season, 13 episodes. In 1999, television writers Ross K. Bagwell Sr. and Stephen Land created Roller Jam for the Nashville Network, which was rebranded to the National Network, which was rebranded into Spike TV, which was rebranded into the Paramount Network. Leo Seltzer's son, Jerry, was hired as the on-air commissioner of the league, and it was co-hosted by Ken Resnick and Lee Rareman, better known as Hawk from American Gladiators. The biggest modernization was that competitors were allowed to use inline skates, but it followed the same Smash Mouth format, including the questionable competitive legitimacy. That iteration lasted from 1999 to 2001. Both series, Roller Games and Roller Jam, are available to watch on YouTube. That's all for this edition of Matt Forgot That. Thanks for listening to me reminisce. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, at Matt Sarosky. You can subscribe to my YouTube page where I'll post videos and clips from the show. If you have any opinions on what I've reviewed, or want to share your own trip down memory lane, use the hashtag MattForgotThat on social. Head over to MattSarosky.com for the latest news and updates, and come back next time for the rewatch and review. Before they could put the kibosh on the pair. <laughs> I'm using the word kibosh. And Sergei Rachmaninoff. And Sergei Rachmaninoff's. And Sergei. And Sergei Rachmaninoff. I'm never going to get this. It was directed by Chuck Russell, who helmed The Nightmare on Elm Street 3, Dream Warriors, the remake of The Bob. The, the Bob. <laughs>